Okay, so, um, so again, my name's Phoenix, I'm also a warrior of the rainbow, about defending the earth and the environment, and all race and all cultures coming together. So this is the workshop, uh, basically how to set up a community centre, or a social centre. Um, number one, anyone wants to take notes along the way, it's good, pass it on, I'm also getting it video, so, uh, yeah, video in it so it can go out to wider people, hopefully more people around the country, around the world, around London, set up more community centres, it's really essential. Found a lot over the years. It really helps to bring community together, uh, bring lots of groups out in the woodwork and, and meet together. Yeah, I don't Number one is finding the space. Um, so getting in or asking the council or landlords or link to a charity or ask for a building, get on and take a building. Um, situation is we've been you know squatting for over 24 years or whatever we have during that time asked we've squatted a lot we've asked for buildings uh, we've got deals on a lot of buildings over the years after we squatted them but people sometimes owners and rest say why didn't you ask before why have you squatted it why didn't you ask us if you could use it and generally we've gone well we have asked before and you always said no so we've got on and squatted it taking direct action uh, um, after three or four years of doing community centres, we did try to get one off his Lincoln Council, did a whole plan and everything, and put it in. They said they were going to give it free to a community group, and then they didn't. So uh, we went on spotted a big old church up the top of uh, Kentish Town High Street, called it the Rainbow Centre, and had a pretty full-on community centre for about two and a half years, but that's a whole other story. So, uh, finding the space of getting in. So a lot of this is based on squatting. What I'm trying to say there is you can actually ask for a building or try and negotiate with the landlord and say, look, you've got this building empty for five years, why don't you let our arts, collective, activist, whatever group come in, community group come and use it. And you never know, somebody might say yes one day. It's always worth asking. <laughs> but otherwise, get on with your crowbar, get your team together. Um, number two is getting in, I uh, do a much longer squatting workshop, another hour long workshop, but I'm going to do a very quick one here that just introduces getting into the building, uh, squatting wise. So, getting in, uh, find the weak point and the five T's. So basically if you imagine the building as a circle, what you're looking around, all around the edge of that circle, you're looking for the weak point, the easy point to get in when you're squatting, which is quite often not the very front door, which is more secured and barricaded up. It could be round the back, it could be round the side, it could be up on the roof, it could be down in the cellar. Look where they haven't protected it so strong. And once you've found that weak point and you somehow applied your tools or, or got in or found something open, then all of the defences of that building, once you're in, become yours. And you've got to get in and secure, you count the number of doors and windows and gates, and once you're in, you then secure those windows, doors and gates. Uh, Aaron? The 5T is just coming up, there we go, is uh, team, tools, timing, typing, and tactics. So it's a little, 5Ts are made up, you know, many years ago, 15, 20 years ago. So, to begin with, your team. You get a team or a group of friends, you go around to a few friends and say, we're thinking of setting up a community centre. Basically, you need, really, you need like five, six, seven of you, fairly minimum number, uh, if you want to set up some kind of project. Uh, seven's a very good number to start with. Okay. All of these projects we squat for years started off with just going around and visiting a few mates' houses or squats and say, we're going to set up a community centre next month, are you up for helping? And you get a list. You get a list of seven people, seven becomes nine, becomes <coughs> eleven, twelve, fifteen, um, and you've got your team. Try and pick reliable people that you worked with before, or new people with lots of energy who are going to do stuff and get a good team together. Next one is tools. So obviously you get your tools together that you need to go in, check everything, you know, your whatever it is, your crowbar, your screwdrivers, your, your padlocks, your, your hammers, your, your saws, your, your hacksaw, whatever it is, get your tools together. Next one is timing. So you have to basically decide <coughs> what's the best time to go and get your squat community centre? Depends on the location, how close residences are, where the main road is and stuff. Sometimes, you know, person number four, sometimes like two, three o'clock in the morning when everyone's gone to sleep and you do the quiet ninja over the roof or whatever and stuff. Um, other times, there may be a situation where you can't do it so well at night, you think maybe to go in the daytime. Sometimes it's good to put yellow jackets on or workman's overalls and make it look like you're meant to be there. Uh, people quite often ignore people who are in, you know, uh, yellow jackets and workmen things. They think they're there to get on with work and they get on with it. Um, another long story, we once did a, a squatted a bank for a community centre on Oxford Street, dressed up as workmen, and everyone's so busy shopping, they just 
rushed past you and they don't even look at you. So uh, <laughs> we got a big board out and started pretending to paint it while a couple of people were working on the door behind the board. But anyway, as I say, another story. Um, so timing, typing. This is one we worked out sort of, you know, a couple of community centres in. Type up one page of A4 that's basically a letter that says, to whom it may concern, we are a collective of whatever it is, community workers, artists, activists, community concerned people, we are, and you, you express it like in, in a way that you don't exactly say you've got permission to be there, but you say this is what we're doing, we're doing it, it's happening, and they're never quite sure sometimes when they're reading it. This, this letter is for the police, for the security, or for the owners when they turn up. So get two or three copies, and basically when they turn up you drop it out the first floor window and give it to them, and what this does, so you say, you know, we are a collective of artists, activists, community workers, we are uh, looking, we are caretaking this building for a community project. We are cleaning, tidying, repairing, and fixing this building up. Um, we are happy to talk and negotiate with the owners. Um, you know, there could be a possibility of us leaving at some date. We want to avoid a court case. Uh, a contact number for us is <coughs> this, this, and this, uh, John, Sarah, whatever it is. <coughs> and what that actually does is provides the police or the security or the owner uh, with something to go back to their bosses with or to calm them down. I mean, quite often when you've squatted a building, you've got an angry owner or the police for security to deal with, and they're a bit, but particularly the police and the security, when they read a piece of paper, it gets them out of angry breaking in mode and into paperwork, bureaucracy, reading the paper. And you see the change come over. By the time they've finished reading the paper, they're like, Okay, they've explained some of it, they've given a contact number. We can number. make them a report. Yeah, we can make a report. They, they, yes, they've given us a letter, I'll pass this on. They can make the report, tick the box. I mean, we once got away with this one uh, off Oxford Street again somewhere where literally the police turned up and the, the padlock was half hanging off the front door. We half bolt cropped it and then said, so quick, the police are here. So we shit, put the bolt croppers in and I stood there in front of this broken lock and the policeman said, what are you doing now? I went, um, and I gave him this letter and he just didn't look at the lock, he was reading the letter. By the time he finished letting, he went, oh yeah, good luck then, see you there. <laughs> <Not too late. laughs> so, typing, get that letter done as soon as possible, and it helps them negotiate with owners, they know who you are, they know you're looking after it, and they've got a contact point for you. Okay, so, last one of the five keys, tactics. Uh, tactics are like, you know, the, the small bits that you're going to do to get there, who's going to, it's good to have someone scouting, someone up the top of the road, one in the road, the other with a phone or a CV if you're more organised, you know, and give you a shout if the police or the owners or security are coming and then you can act accordingly and uh, uh, like a walkie-talkie. You can get them for about 20 quid down that sort of um, But basically, you know, whether you're going to go in round the back, who's, you know, going to go over the roof, what your tactics are to take the building, what, you know, that sort of thing. So, um, some more bits on taking the building are there's an old military term, secure the perimeter. Basically, you want to, again, check how many doors, how many windows and how many gates you've got secured. So if there's one at the front, one at the back, once you've got in through your weak point, you then basically secure the front and the back door, drill it up, use a little bit for builder strips, screws, whatever it is, um, and secure those gates. Uh, those gates and those doors. Um, and as I say, once it actually means that um, the metal doors are very, once you've got in through the weak point, the metal door is a very strong defence for you, so it's good to actually leave it there, particularly for the first few weeks until you know what the situation is. Yeah, change, change the mortise lock, you can usually undo a few of the screws and wiggle it out and um, put your own lock in and change it. You can take a mortise lock down to the locksmith and for £10 pound they'll give you a new key, so I've lost the key. Okay, so secure the perimeter, all those gates, windows, doors, whatever it is. Then you negotiate from a window. It's good um, when the police or the security or the owners turn up. It's good to negotiate from a position of strength. From a first floor window you talk down at them from, you know, you've got the castle, you've, you've taken it and you're saying, you know, Yes, we've occupied it. Yes, you can see our section six. We've squatted it. Um, we're willing to talk to the owners. Here's a letter. Read this. And then you talk to them and it feels, you know, it's good to negotiate from the window. Um, 
You don't always have to go out and talk to the police, even if they want you to come out. Just stand your ground, stay in. When you get more experience, sometimes you go out, but you really don't want the police to try and arrest one or two persons that's outside. Um, you can give any name you want. Yeah, I've used about 23 over the years. Um, what tile is good? Huh? What tile what is good? What tile is a great name, yeah. Uh, <laughs> peasants Revolt. What tiler? <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so, how to set up a community centre workshop. Do you just want to say your name or anything about squatting? Um, you come for the workshop? Yes. Yeah, what's your name? Yes. Yes, sir. Oh, cool. Yes, Marina. Marina. You squatting somewhere at the moment? Bohemia. Great, cool, cool. Okay. Welcome. Oh, they wanted to cover. Okay. <laughs> All right, so next one's uh, triple barricade, entrance and exits before sleep. It, you know, when you get in, you've got to check and double check and three times check your whole perimeter. Have you remembered every door and every window that the security or the police or the owners can get back in? And it's better to over barricade before you go to sleep than wake up in the morning with seven massive great big builders with lumps of wood going, get the fuck out now. So always barricade as hard as you can, extra, extra, extra. And even if you think you've done enough, go and do a bit more. Because you're much more safer if you've done a bit more. Um, video and camera shield. It's really useful nowadays. You know, a lot more people have phones with cameras, sometimes with video. It's really important if the police or the security owners come as quickly as possible, start filming them. Even if you have a, cam a phone that doesn't have a camera, do it anyway. I mean, back in the day, we used to get these crappy old, like, 1960s video cameras that didn't work, that didn't have any film in it, and point them at the bailiffs or the police and go, we're filming you, behave yourself. And we weren't even filming them at all. But it, police behave themselves more when they know they're being filmed. They don't try and break in so much. They don't try and push the law. They will try and push you a bit. If they're being filmed, they know they have to behave themselves and follow the law a bit more. If you're really organised, someone who's a legal observer, get someone with a yellow jacket, with legal observer written on the back, standing outside, saying to the police, this has been legally squatted, no damage has been caused, um, if the owners want us out, they'll just have to go to court. And that's kind of three things that we always repeat to them. And that's the general part of your conversation of talking with the police or the security. Um, and you always end on they'll just have to go to court. Because the police know, the bottom line is, generally the police will stay around for 20, 30 minutes checking it, and then they've got to go off and deal with another situation. And when you repeat that into them, I actually said like three times, four times, face out with other bits of conversation. We're looking after it, we're trying to set up a community centre, we're good people, we're tidying, repairing, but you know, if they want us out, they just have to go to court. Uh, we haven't caused any damage. Um, we've been here, you always say that you've been there longer, than you actually were. Even if you've been in for one night, you say you've been there three, four days, you've been there two, three nights, you've been there a week. Because the police think if you've been there a week, you've probably tidied up any of the damage and stuff. And stuff. The other one's to disappear any tools that you've used, any big crowbars or bolt croppers or anything like that. You don't want any of that around when the police turn up, they do try and push in. Um, okay, cleaning and tidying. One thing, um, yep. keep in mind the police might come more than once. Sometimes they turn up and then another lot come who don't realise that you've squatted the place because the police's information really doesn't, they don't, it doesn't hook up at all. Like they don't really know what the left hand, right hand is doing. So when the next one comes, um, it's good to have the reference number for the first lot that we asked them. Can we have a reference number and mm -hmm. give it to the second lot so they can check? And then it's like that means you don't have to have the whole fucking conversation again. Cool. Um, yeah, happy for you know interactions and question and answers as we go along. Um, I'll speed it up if you need to at point. Just to reinforce that point from Donnie, I'm really glad you brought it up because mm -hmm. it's so important that when the first lot of police come, you get their name, their number, mm -hmm. uh, what police station they're from, and there's also something called a CAD number. Mm -hmm. And when you've got that, when the second lot of police turn up, and even the third lot, sometimes they'll try and do you again. Oh, we're going to look for damage, we're going to look for, you know, have you got any electricity on or whatever. Um, get their numbers and repeat it to the second lot, and they'll just radio in, they go this number, and they go, all right, it's already been dealt with, they're gone in five minutes, rather than staying around for half an hour. Okay, so that's, you know, there's a longer squatting workshop that I do. This is the community centre workshop. So, um, coming on to number three, which is <coughs> organising structure. So, yeah. 
the thing is that the last time that when I tried to register electricity, I fucking found a nightmare. Before it was very easy in the internet, just blah, 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 you print out something from the email, but now they have so many information. Did you guys from your experience in the last building you've been exposing these guns to the We use e contrast. Actually, as far as I know, the police is in charge of stealing electricity. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, uh, yeah, so let me cover that. Yeah. One of the things I, I, I do normally is when I go in, I call the company, I put my name in, mm. but uh, you have to, sometimes you find some operators that are quite demanding, so I just try again mm. with different operators. With this new internet, no problem, this last time with the charts, I'm sorry, it was like a nightmare. Okay, yeah, so just... For numbers of the past, blah, 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 so I feel something has changed. So okay. The quick one on that, really, because this comes in more into the squatting workshop, but the, the quick one on that, and I should cover damage as well. So basically, in the old days, what we used to do when you squatted it was you'd get a marker pen, and you would write next to the meter reading, whatever the meter is, 67942, and you would write a date, 14th of February, 2000 or whatever, and, that, and then underneath you would put recorded meter readings, intention to pay from this date. And then, nowadays, you take a photo of it. That's the bare minimum that you've got to do. The police come, you say, we've recorded the meter readings, we're ta collecting money and we're going to pay for it, therefore we've got an intention to pay, therefore we're not stealing the electricity. The second way that's come about in the last five, six, seven years with the internet is you go to either like British Gas or Ecotricity, we found works, you basically go in, you put an old address that actually exists, it must be an old address, you say, I want to change my domestic supply, you don't have to go into business or anything like that, just domestic supply from 27 Acacia Avenue or whatever to this new warehouse, this new whatever you've moved into, you put the new address, you put a name, John Smith, and then basically <coughs> that page that's got John Smith wants to pay the electric at this address, you do a screen capture of on your computer and you print that. And as soon as that's printed and you make get it from there out to the building or whatever, from you know, makes out, um, you keep that there by the door, and if the police turn up, say you're stealing electric, you say no, we've recorded the metering, it's got intention to pay, and we've recorded to pay with ecotricity, and here's a bit of paper to prove it, and that covers it. That usually impresses them quite a lot. But generally, <laughs> what, <laughs> what we do is don't turn the lights on and any visible electric until you've done at least the meter recording and hopefully the bit of paper as well, because the police will try to say theft of electric, and they've kicked the door in before to try and arrest three or four people. Generally, they can only arrest one person for theft, but they will push it, try and arrest three people and get them out. Have you heard of any case in the recent years guys, where this happened? It's more like a urban legend. Arrested like for electric? Say, but I don't see people like yes, that has happened a number of times. Most of the buildings get evicted because of it, more than the rest. Yeah, it does happen. Okay, so moving on to the other ones, for organising structure. So. Create a project organising meeting. Traditionally, we do something like Monday, 7 o'clock, after work hours, the people who are working and not working can come. Um, choose a facilitator. A uh, facilitator means to make things easy. Um, a, it's a revolving role, a uh, facilitator, and a note taker. Notes can be typed up and networked. It's good to have a record of what your community centre or whatever has agreed, and then people who weren't in the meeting can read it, or you can email it out to your wider support group or whatever. Um, so, at the beginning of that meet, you do a name round. Each person says their names, their name and any links to a group or experience or skills that they have, also adding things for the agenda. So, like we did here at the beginning, have a name go round and people add stuff, whatever they want to chat about, uh, in a circle, direct democracy kind of style. -y. Um, it's good knowledge of, of setting up meetings to have a time limit on it. People get very tired in meetings. When it goes over about an hour and a half to two hours or whatever, people get tired, they get tetchy, they start, arguments start for various reasons because people want to leave. So a good facilitator will say, right, is that group happy to have a one hour meeting? The group agrees and then you say, if we've got to go on to more, we'll extend by 15 minutes or half an hour. Does the group want to extend by 15 minutes or half an hour? And then anything else you put it on to next week's meeting if, if it's been going on too long. And that way you have short and more efficient meetings that people enjoy rather than dragging on for three hours or whatever. So, uh, time limit. So, explain direct democracy. One hand up for a question. You want to say something in the group? Uh, two hand fingers for a direct point. So, this is like, direct point is you're talking about bike repair workshop and somebody knows somebody's got bikes. 
you're talking about funding and someone knows a way you can get funding, you're talking about barricading and somebody's good at barricading that can help with it, whatever it is. Um, so that's a direct point. Uh, jazz hands for agreeing consensus, generally silent clapping if you're discussing proposals and a lot of people going like that, or you ask, is there a consensus for this and everyone's doing that, um, then you, you work out you've got consensus. Um, there's also something called a temperature check, which is really good to put in. Um, before you go for a formal consensus, you can ask for a temperature check. What do people feel about having this event on Thursday? And if people put their hands up high, they're really into it. If people put their hands down really low, they're not into it. And you look around the circle or the group and you can see whether everyone's hands up like that, great, we're into it, or not so much. Um, T is for a technical point when you're having a meeting, which is something that's outside the meeting that's going to affect the group that somebody wants to sort of cut in and say, this needs to be said now, that the police are outside, or that the basement's flooding, or we need something to bring in now at this point you need to know. Um, rolling hands for move on, as in this person has been speaking for 17 minutes and we kind of want to move on to the next <laughs> point or whatever, please move on. And we look around the room, there's three or four people doing that, it's really time for the facilitator to go, come on mate, let's move on to the next subject. Thank you for your contribution, brother, sister, that's what it is. Um, and a signal for block, which is um, either that one or block can be like that. I think that's a bit better because a lot of people go, yeah, solidarity, giving a Che Guevara, and you can't quite tell whether they're blocking or they're putting their hands up to support the cause. Um, block should only be used in real, uh, if you really feel really, 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 really strong about something that you want to stop. You know, the group might have been discussing something for half an hour, an hour, and if you want to block it, you, what we, we've said over the years is that you should come up with another proposal. If you want to block something, you have to come up with an alternative proposal that you can put to the group. Otherwise, you end up with people just blocking for minimal reasons and stopping hours of discussion. And you can also get agent provocateurs from government or whatever who come in and just try and block everything, stop your group process from working. So it's good if people want to block stuff. Only use it very, very rarely and occasionally, but if they're going to use a block, can they think of an alternative? or what we should be doing instead. Okay, <coughs> so that's just some things on direct democracy, how meetings run. Um, it's become a lot more familiar with people through Occupy, and when Occupy went out to a thousand cities around the world, it's a really good thing to see people experimenting with direct democracy and ways of running groups. Um, something in the activist community we've worked on for years, and 15 years ago people were like, consensus, what, what are you going on about? Why can't we just vote on it and stuff? But Consensus takes a bit more time, but it involves the whole group putting ideas in and making more <coughs> effective decisions for, you know, at the end that's involved a lot of people. So, the weekly meeting is a decision-making body for the project or group. Uh, the process needs explaining and clarifying in non-hierarchical groups. So, mm. a lot of things over the years, we've tried to uh, create our community centres in circles, uh, in a non-hierarchical way, uh, getting everyone involved, everyone involved with the decision-making process. Um, so it's good to, you know, it's, it's good to do, do things in that way. It takes a little bit, bit more time. And it needs to explain to people, you know, the benefits of doing it in a non hierarchical way rather than voting where the majority can sometimes vote for something that's going to press a minority. They can vote to go to war, they can vote to whatever, hang people, whatever. Um, it's better to discuss things around. So remember, action points are very important. Who is going to take action on an idea, make it happen, and report back to the group or say we need more help or the situation has changed. So when you're having a meeting, as it goes round, yes, yes. people are going to say, uh, we need to do this. Right. And it can come up in your meeting again three weeks later. Oh, yeah, we said we need to get in touch with so-and-so about the bike repair or so-and-so about the computers yes. or whatever. Um, you write down an action point, the note taker. So Aaron or, or you know Alfonso or someone says, yeah, I'll do it. I'll get in touch with the council. I'll get in touch with so-and-so. And then you note down the action points. And then the next week, you try and look at those action points and see if they've been done, see if they need help with them. So the person can come back and say, oh, I couldn't quite do this because I need another person to help me or I didn't have the right number. Try and help people make the action points happen rather than weeks later you think, oh, that was a good idea, but no one's actioned it for me. Okay. The search consensus flowchart on the internet. So um, there's things on how you make a consensus decision. People make a proposal. People then discuss that proposal, you then have adjustments, so people say, I like this proposal, but I think we should adjust it slightly so that it includes this or whatever. 
and then you get a new proposal that's taken on board the adjustments and then you put it to the group and you ask, do we have consensus on that? Does everyone want to you know, agree to it consensus-wise or do we need any more discussion or more adjustments or does anyone want to block it or do you want to come up with any better alternatives and stuff? And there's a little flow chart you can find on the internet about that. Um, Occupy St Paul's got it down uh, very, very well and it's really beautiful to see it going out to a thousand cities around the world. Uh, historically, you know, goes right back to the Quakers. The Quakers worked with consensus uh, decision making. Uh, climate, you know, activist circles and squatting circles, we've, we've worked on it for many years. And climate camp really started to put it out to more people. And like I say, Occupy got it around the world. And it's an amazing, incredible thing to see a thousand cities around the world experimenting with direct democracy and consensus and discussing all these things and getting everyone involved in the decision rather than some hierarchical bureaucracy. Uh, multinational corporation destroying all your, your local area, whatever it is. So, next point on. Um, talking circles are also a very useful community tool, tool to create a circle. It's, it's an old tribal thing, it's a Native American thing, it's a, it's a rainbow thing, like I say, I'm a warrior of the rainbow. Um, by creating a circle, you pass a stick round um, and that goes around each person who gets a chance to talk. Um, it means that most importantly it's a listening circle where everyone else, is, uh, everyone else listens to. Sometimes louder voices in a group, men's voices, whatever it is, dominate situations, talking a lot. It's good to actually pass it around and everyone gets a chance to talk and everyone gets a chance to listen. Um, that helps make everyone feel part of it and everyone has an equal voice. Um, and creates diversity of opinions. It's, it, it's a good way of involving people and getting ideas out. It's not so good for the decision making process. You can, there is a way of passing it around to consensus and see if everyone agrees to that consensus. But talking circles really are something, you know, we have a Monday organising meeting where you make decisions and then once every week or two you'd have a talking circle to get, you know, things out from people. And sometimes the quietest voices have the deepest wisdom, you know brothers, sisters, women who haven't talked a lot, suddenly when the talking stick comes around, come out with deep, amazing wisdom the whole group needs to hear. Kimmy, was there a question? Um, um, you mentioned that it creates a spiral of energy as well, the stick being passed around the circle and the stick right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Right, so I just did anyone else who hasn't introduced themselves want to introduce themselves just so uh, your name and uh, anything about squatting or way squatting or anything you want to say? Yeah. Did you do earlier? Yeah. Hello everybody, I'm William. Squatting somewhere? Okay. Are you squatting somewhere? Okay. Well here we are. Okay. Okay, don't worry about you. Okay, so it's always good trying to keep remembering, bring it up circular. Um, so the next one on number four is use of space. So basically, space allocation. <coughs> I mean, sometimes you get into a building and it's only got one or two rooms. Sometimes you get into a big warehouse block and you've got 20, 30 rooms, whatever it is. Um, so generally there's a formula with a lot of our community centres of how we allocate space. Uh, I think the old one we used to say is, the start of any community centre is a kettle and a table of leaflets. And basically the kettle and a few tea bags comes a cash, coffee, coffee and uh, then your, your table of leaflets about whatever becomes your information, little networking area, and then you expand out from that and you have whatever, an art space, you have a bike repair space. You have so some of the things you can do with space are a cafe, you can have an event space, 
which can put on all different sorts of, you know, music, play rehearsals, local mums, kids groups, whatever it is, come and uh, come and use it. Uh, a library, the library in all of our community centres used to start with you just get a shelf and you get your trusty black marker pen, which is the most useful tool in any community centre. Always take your black marker pen in and you write library on a bit of paper above six or seven or ten books and that becomes your library and please bring books. And like two weeks later, from those ten books, you've got 30, 40 books. A month later, you've got 200 books. By the time you get evicted, you've got 300 books, whatever it is. But that builds up your library. And, you know, it's a free library. People can bring them and, and take them away and whatever. Uh, a kids' area. It's always good to make a community all ages. But remember, with kids' areas, it, uh, parents bring their children at their responsibility. Uh, everyone enters your squat at their own risk and responsibility. You bring people, bring their kids in. They've got to be responsible while they're there, unless they make an arrangement with someone to look after their kids at that sort of point. Don't have parents shooting off down the pub and leaving you with 20, 20 kids. I've been there. Okay, so, <laughs> uh, free shop or swap shop, one of my favourite bits of the community centre. It's always good to set up a free shop, a swap shop. It's a great way of um, undermining that commercial, whatever you call it, system to give things out for free, to share things. Uh, we need a lot more sharing in the world. So you just, again, get your marker pen, write free shop up somewhere on a bit of paper and uh, stick a rail up, get a load of old clothes and wherever you find them, skip second-hand shop, make wardrobe when they're moving, whatever. And just create a free shop and a swap shop where people can bring stuff and change it. Uh, it's always good that somebody tidies up the free shop, swap shop, because it turns from a nice free shop, swap shop, all organised, with shoes down by into a cat pile. Everyone goes, yeah, look at that, throws it on the floor. <laughs> Some beautiful person who loves the community so it comes and tidies it up. Um, Bike workshop is a brilliant one to do. There's various some mates who are good at fixing bikes and stuff, so <coughs> it's good to have a bike workshop. Again, randomised car culture and get you out there on an eco-friendly tip. Um, <coughs> arts and creative space. So we always used to have something we call the creative space, one of the rooms that we'd have. Basically, uh, we start off, we just stick a load of pens and pencils and paper and brushes and art stuff, <coughs> and then people would skip stuff and bring stuff back. And that would be a space anyone go into and paint amazing masterpieces like this. Big multicoloured one on the wall there. Um, I the idea of having a smashing corner when you uh, use that to spirit from the party. A smashing corner? Yeah, and then you use that to build up some location. Oh, okay, right, yeah. yeah. So get, rather than people smashing up the squat, if you go in that corner, smash that up and make some art happen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's good to get down as you use some um, <coughs> Another one, easy one, quite a, a cinema. <coughs> so, um, yep, you find a friend who's got a projector, you set up a cinema night, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, whatever it is. <coughs> it's, a, you know, two of the most easy events to start off with. We have that project, if we have nothing, we get tomorrow. Yeah, okay, yeah. cool, cool. What are the... Um, we have a project, we have project, and uh, a projector and Sonic. Okay, cool. You're doing some cinema maybe. Okay. Then you're watching you're showing Secret City tomorrow, aren't you? Yeah. I think it's Secret City. Yeah. Secret City, yeah. okay, yeah. cool. It's really good to um so I just finished the uh it, the <coughs> use of space. Cinema accommodation is a separate space. It's when you're running a community centre it's really good to have some rooms that are like bedrooms for the crew to stay in that are a bit separate from the main community centre space because it takes a lot of love and a lot of energy to run these community spaces and it's good <coughs> that you know, there's two or three or four or more bedrooms where the crew can actually sleep and they're out of the main communal space because when you're running these things it's hard to be in them 24 hours a day with people coming and people going so it's good to have your own kind of separate accommodation space, other bedrooms. An info or networking area, so again just collect a load of leaflets, start by going to the local library, go to the health food shop, go to the local activist centre, and the London Action Resource Centre in Whitechapel, you can pick up loads of info, stick it on a table, you've got an information networking area. Get some blue tacks, start sticking it up on the walls. One of my old jokes is, you know, I'm addicted to getting into empty buildings and sticking things on the wall with blue tack. It's, uh, it's a really creative thing to do, spread some knowledge. Um, a computer or tech area, which turns into a net cafe. You can get some mates with an old computer, plug it in, get someone on an internet phone or whatever, and you can offer internet to people who come in. Um, food growing. Food growing, yeah, our next one. 
Yes, so that's mm. the very next one, is the garden area. As soon as possible, start planting some stuff, because whether it's in some ground that's next to it or whether it's in pots, it helps when negotiating with the owners, because if they do, you do get them to come round, and I come into negotiation a bit later, I think, but <coughs> if you do get them to come round and they see that you're digging potatoes and carrots and onions and you're digging a garden, they're something like, oh, I'm going to take you to court next week and kick you out, and then suddenly they're like, oh, you're gardening, oh, that looks really nice, oh, yeah, I'm into gardening as well, and then, and then the person who's doing it says, oh, yeah, well, we're hoping to be here in August when harvest comes so we can eat the potatoes, and he's like, well, it's only like May, uh, maybe I'll let you stay till then. It, it creates a longer <laughs> term thing when you're thinking about gardening, you're digging in, you're thinking longer. So just get some plants going and, and whatever you can. Um, so it also helps your morale if you've got gardening, grow food, digging for victory. Um, Recording studio is another one you can do. You can get some mates who could with computer, uh, you know, tech stuff. You've got some recording stuff. Lots of people like to come in and record their music and get bands going and, and whatever it is. We have, mm. during my visit, the garden centre, we have 15 channels recording studio connected to computers, so we have mixed channels and recording studio. Yeah. And uh, yeah. do you have a radio as well then? Radio. I have a six and less radio. Have a radio? Do it. Do it. Radio up. Okay, so that's some of the use of space, and there's loads more. You've seen lots, lots done over the years in, in I think it's um, what they call it the law of space. When you have space, it fills up. You can get into a 20-room building, and you start off, I think there's one uh, section by section. Um, what you do is you open, if you've got a big building that's got 20 rooms, you open up small bits first, and you just have like two, three rooms. So you have a, you know, a reception room, a, a cafe room with information, and then you set up an art room or a bike repair room or, or whatever it is. <coughs> um, okay, so there's a couple of things there on events and uh, sustainable activism. It's, it's important to take rest, I've got noted here, and sustainable activism. So take time off the community project, take time off the protest or the campaign. When you're really at it a lot and you're trying to run these spaces, um, it's good to take at least one day, maybe two days a week, off the community centre, off the social centre, off the protest, because if you keep at it too long, it can burn you out and you get tired, you get grumpy, whatever it is. A um, couple of other things on events, to start off with, <coughs> I mean, we ran things years ago, what the Exodus Collective used to call 24-7-365, when we did a big old church, the Rainbow Centre on the top of Kentishdown High Street, <laughs> and it was very, very full on, to be open... We, it was an open door project, people come in any time of the day or night, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, have a cup of tea, have some food, have a split, meet new friends, hang out. And that was an amazing social experiment, but it also got pretty hectic and pretty tiring at points and lots of factors on it. So the learning from that is do a less number of days and a limited number of hours and do it well. And discuss that with your group. <coughs> so you say, how many days a week do we want to open? Okay? Let's start off with, say, two or three days and do those two or three days well rather than trying to keep open seven days and getting tired. So an example of you get into a building, you could do two days, you can have a cinema night and a food night. And that's what the Cabellet Cafe down in Bristol which started off as a, as a squat for about eight years and then they got a co-op together and then they got a mortgage co-op and the building's still there 25 years later from the squat to co-op. <coughs> and they did basically... I think it was Thursday and Sunday, food nights, vegan cafe, really amazing food, and they did it really, really well, and they had like an info shop, and I think they had a bike repair day. But the two simplest ones to do that you can set up within really a week or two of getting in, once you've done the tidying up, fixing up, is uh, a cinema night and a food night. So you get some friends who are good at cooking and say, right, Sunday night we're going to cook a big food, invite everyone around. Thursday night we're going to have a cinema night, we're going to show this. And try and intersperse like interesting and fun films with your activist political social films don't just bang on all the hardcore political because they need a bit of entertainment as well the posse either. so <laughs> what else ok use of space um, one little note I've got to make there about what I help us yeah, yeah. good Cool, cool. Good, very good input on that. Yeah, healing spaces, dojo, martial arts practice, 
All these things, there are so many people out there who are desperate for space and they can't afford to pay for an artist studio for a big martial arts in the uh, hangar in uh, the whole financial, we have a basement. We were going uh, planning to set up a uh, tattoo studio, a shop, a healing okay. field, but uh, things are not going as well as planned. Well, we will see. Thing is, there's always ones that can fit into different buildings. There wasn't always. Yeah, yeah. but the idea. Cool. Is yeah. Cool. Cool. Um, one thing I've got to note is uh, I was about to say to a policeman on Saturday when he was trying to shut down his party with him. Um, you're not open to the public because you can say that when when you're uh, when you're running a community centre, a social centre. Um, sometimes years ago, they try to stop us from doing this big peace not war gig, and they try to come and say you're open to the public. Therefore, this law and this law and this law apply to you. And my health and safety officer friend who used to work for Camden Council gave us all the answers to give back to me. He said we're not open to the public. We're only open to guests and friends of the resident occupiers. And so basically, everyone who comes in is a friend or a guest or a friend of a, a friend of a friend of people coming in here. We're not open to the public officer or whatever. Yeah. 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 Build the network. Build the network. As we had to say to the police on Saturday, you know, yeah, there may be 1,500 people in there, but they're all friends of friends of friends. <laughs> Seven birthday <laughs> parties. <laughs> and they come under their own thing. Yeah. That's the other one. Uh, risk, their own risk and responsibility. So, you don't. Sometimes later on in spots, you can get public liability insurance if somebody's got a, you know, can set up a kind of, you know, uh, community interest company or whatever. But basically, you have a sign at the front that says, uh, "You enter at your own welcome to our community space. You enter at your own risk and responsibility. You are responsible for yourself while you're here, basically. And that covers you on a lot of things like insurance and stuff like that. So everyone reads that when they come in. I would just like to say, like when I said, like that that safe was big enough already, I, I really meant to authentically that safe was big enough already. Like for a party and an event, and everybody that comes to these doors is a guest and a, and, and a, a friend. Like, um, I don't know, I don't really do the parties and stuff, but a community space. Like, our community is quite the community in Oakland. Uh, no. Well, uh, sometimes I, you know, I used to be part of what the problem. One of the solutions I was fine is uh, in the doors, you know, it's, it's very good to have a, like a list of people. You advise, you unite, you face people, whatever, and you get a list of people who want to come to you and get something happy with like a guest list and make the people give the name or email when they come in. Yeah. And, uh, but another problem I always find is even my friend, sometimes you're inside to say maybe for something. Okay, donation. That brings up a couple of numbers. I'm, I'm not really going to go into the wider one of doing parties and events, I and mean then we say a little bit about events and community centres probably, but um, one thing to be very clear with authorities is like, um, what we used to say is everything we do is free. People can be asked for a suggested donation. If they suggested donation, one pound, five pound, whatever it is. Um, but we're not actually charging a fixed rate. And if you say it's five pound to get into this or ten pound or whatever, the police can then try and put some public laws on you. But you say, no, we're not charging people, it's free. There's a suggested donation for this workshop, for this event that they're coming to, cinema, blah, whatever. Um, so, let's cover most of them. Okay, next one is networking. We can say a little bit more in events, but events-wise, when you have a space, lots of groups will come to you and ask to use that community centre space. They will ask about theatre, about kids things, about parties, about workshops. Um, it's good in a way if you can get people to write down what they want to do and bring it to that Monday meeting so that the whole group can listen and discuss and uh, you know say yes we're into it or you know ask information about it and stuff like that. But it's some of the best fun you'll have in your life is setting up community centres and having people come in and do parties and events and all sorts of things because you meet all sorts of incredible people who've got a lot of skills and a lot of enthusiasm and really want space to do stuff. So encourage that, you know, that people do come in, but watch what you're doing in the space as well that's well looked after. And also with, with things like parties and stuff like that, if you're running a community centre building, many people, especially when you've got a big hall and a big space, will come and ask you to do lots of parties there. And you've got to think, where are you trying to negotiate with the owners and get a deal and be there longer? Where are you trying to get on with your neighbours? 
you can do parties, you could do some events, but my recommendation and learning over the years is don't let people party at every single weekend because you will be kicked out in a few weekends because you'll have hacked off your neighbours and the owners. If you want to do it well, do something once every month or so or whatever it is and you know, Especially be aware of everything. Spread it out so you're not making a lot of noise regularly. Um, and you know, if you take care to soundproof and take care to watch how it's going on with your neighbours and you go out and you listen around the edges and you try and tell them to bring the noise down a bit or the, the volume, you can get, get away with. Have a lot of events over, over a long time. Um, okay, number six is networking. <laughs> so networking, the very oldest form is word of mouth. I think my mate Susanna said we used to call it gossiping in the old days. <laughs> but basically, word of mouth is one of the most important ways of networking. Um, you can also have leaflets, um, contact number, website, email, uh, things like Facebook, Twitter, posters and banners. But Coming back to face-to-face -face and word of mouth, um, it's one of the best ways of networking. You send out a thousand emails and you send out whatever, how many Facebooks or whatever, but when you actually go to someone with a leaflet and say, look, this event's on here, and you look them in the eyes and you smile at them and you say, this is going to be a really brilliant event, come to our food night, our cafe night, our cinema night, it's going to be really good, and you spend a few minutes chatting with someone and interacting, they are ten times more likely to come to your event than just getting a random email flyer or whatever it is. Um, so yeah, keep networking, keep putting the information out there about what you're trying to do. Um, it's very important to make a leaflet about your community centre as early as possible, even, you know, as close on to getting the place open and get it out so that you can give it to your neighbours. Give it to your neighbours as soon as possible to local businesses. Local businesses will give you food, you go to local fruit and veg shops, say, if you just go up as a person and say, look, we're running a project, can you give us some old veg at the end of the night? Yeah, sometimes they do it. If you go with a leaflet saying, this is our community centre, a little logo that you made up, whatever it is, the, the colourful, the earth community centre, whatever, um, local businesses are way more likely to give you all the old fruit and veg at the end of the night or whatever it is, and you can do a good cap or whatever. Ah, oh, that's the business. New, new Common Garden Market, yeah. Yeah. I think that's fed a few, <laughs> few hundred thousand spotters <laughs> over the decades, definitely, that one, yeah, yeah, good. Know, know the good distribution points, you're going to find a new common garden market. Okay, so give it to the neighbours, give local business, food. The other one is uh, on the networking. If you could be organised before, like there was a group I went a few years ago called the Really Free School, <coughs> and if you can get your schedule of workshops done even before you've opened the building or in the first week, it's really effective because it, it's like what they used to do is, you know, they'd have a group that was going to occupy and squat the building and then there was another sort of mini working group that basically organised a schedule of workshops. And as they went in, they basically, they print that off and they stick it outside. So you spend whatever it is, three, four days, tidying up, clearing up the building, getting the health and safety, getting rid of any of the rubbish and mess. And then you stick signs up and literally on a board outside they'd have a list of, you know, on Monday we've got sewing, on Tuesday we've got bike repair, on Wednesday we've got tango, on Thursday we've got Spanish lessons, on Friday we've got cinema, on Saturday it's food, feast sharing, on Sunday we're all having a barefoot boogie or whatever it is. Um, so get those workshop lists out there as early as possible because it makes a much more effective community centre and people see what you're doing. Uh, Okay, so remember also to check how the front looks regularly because, you know, when you're in the building all, a lot of the time, it's good to see how it's looking for your neighbours and stuff, things like that. Like, uh, like courts, you know, like the sound effect. Yes, there's a, a very mm. old motel in Bath Street, which is Okay, check the health service. I think that's point eight. I'm just going to do point seven, negotiate with owners and then. Um, yeah, any questions or points as we go on? Stick your hand up or I'm bung them in. So the next point, number seven, is negotiating with owners. Which I think is relevant for a few of the crews around at the moment, a few things going on. <coughs> Basically, we built our skills up over the years and got better and better and better at negotiating with owners. And there's various tips and tactics that you can use. Um, the first one is a letter of introduction, like I said right at the beginning, uh, with your contact number at the bottom. When you initially meet the owner or the security guard, try and get their name 
try and get a contact number for them after you've built up a little bit of rapport. Obviously, you're going to have to deal with them initially being a bit angry, a bit shirty or whatever. Um, but after they've read the letter, they calm down a little bit. You can talk to them. You can talk to them from a window. If they look like they're not really angry with large bits of wood, sometimes when you're more experienced, two or three of you can go out front and start talking to them on a bit more friendly basis. But and you do that when you're more experienced and you're sure they're not really aggro. Um, if you're dealing with the agents, mm. sometimes it happens you can have a, a singular problem. If I was playing that, but you have like agents. It's very really difficult because if not only one person, it's three persons. Most of the time, you don't really want to talk to you. You don't yep. to do it. Okay, there's something an old sales tax would say you've got to find the decision maker. Who is yeah. actually makes the decision on it? It's not usually the agent, it's the, uh, it's the owner owner, the, the real owner. You need to try and find your way through to them. The person who comes to see you might only be security, might be a building agent, might be something, but. Um, you have to try and find who are the owners, can we get a contact number from If they won't give you a contact for them, you give them your contact, say please get them to ring us. And the letter. Uh, you can follow that up a few days later with a project proposal, which is like a bit longer than a letter, two, three pages, listing out what you want to do, the workshops, the cleaning and tidying and repairing you've done. <coughs> you know, mention every single thing you have fixed. We fixed the roof, we fixed the windows, we fixed the door, we tied it up, we cleaned up, whatever it is. Um, first contact with the owners or representatives, get a contact number, begin negotiations, keep in contact, keep sending letters, go to visit, which means going to visit, find out where their head office is and go and visit their head office. Just take it to them, don't just wait round till some court papers land on your map. Uh, go to visit, tell them about new project, be relentless, be relentless, keep going, keep networking, take it to them. What you've got in squatting is what I call the interim period, which is between when you get first contact and when the lawyers get involved and they serve you with court papers. Now between that, when you know, you've squatted it, it could be a few days or a week or two before the owners turn up and then you get first contact. So you've got that week or two or a few days. Then you've got from first contact through to the court papers arriving. And in that interim period, that's when you've got to work really, really hard if you want to get a deal. And this is really, really key, and pass this on to all the other squatters. As soon as you get first contact, try and get a number, try and give them this negotiation letter, talk to them when they're on the door, try and get the contact, get, and go, please, let us stay, we're good people, look at the pictures, the photos we've got, the proposal, we're tidying, we're cleaning, repairing, look, we're cheaper than security, if it's empty, it's only going to get squatted again, we'll fix the place up for you, keep going, keep trying. A uh, couple of questions here, we've got people on. Yeah, I just to say that, like, if the owner doesn't turn up for quite a while, then land registry is usually quick to get to that. So yeah. Sometimes you can get quite a direct route to them. Yeah, three pounds, though. Yeah, three pounds. You have to pay by card, but, like, if you do that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good call. Yeah. So check the land registry. Um, generally, I look into it. You know, sometimes I find a really good for the owner just taking it, you know. And at the moment you have this space, you don't use it. You know, when you have future planning, you need to start yeah. to work, you know, just let us not give us a notice that we can live without yeah. carbon. Good point, yeah. Okay. So wait for you. Yeah. 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 This is a good way to for you to uh, set yourself as a, as a counter to Camelot. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, that's two very good points there. Um, what I found chills the owner out is you say, we will leave at a certain date and you can avoid the court costs. Now, what you're trying to do here, we, we, we call it caretaking over the years because we're taking care of the building. When you're running a community centre, you have a certain number of people who are working on the project, like caretakers, keep an eye, they're on rotor, on shift while the place is open. Or we could have at least a couple of people when you're open who are aware and dealing with stuff, welcome people to the building, whatever it is. But when you say to the owners, the first question is, how long till you want to use it? And then when you've worked that out, now sometimes they'll tell you the truth, sometimes they'll lie, sometimes they'll say, oh, I've got to get my builders in next week, and oh, I want you out, and I've got to go, blah, blah, blah. but then <coughs> you find out a bit more, oh, well, we're going to turn it into flats, we haven't got planned permission yet, how long is that going to take you, mate? Oh, well, maybe three months, six months. So you say, right, this is the interim period before you get your planning permission and you start, is there any chance that we could stay here 
as three, we used to work three words, CSM, caretakers, security and maintenance. We will be free caretakers, security and maintenance for you until you get your plan permission and you want to build in three months or six months. We will make an agreement with you to leave in three months. That way you don't leave it empty and it, you know, gets squat or you need to trash or whatever. With the geometer you can, you can have that for any time you need. You that need you're getting some good points in there, reminding me on. So basically the other point is there, you say to them, we will allow access, given 24 hours notice, for your workmen or your surveyors. Now, that's often a clincher in getting this deal, because he doesn't necessarily want to pay the owner. It costs, I was shocked when I found out a few years ago, it costs up to like three, four thousand pounds to keep in a living, well not living, but a 24 hour security guy in the building. So you're actually saving the owners three grand a week by saying we will look after it for you and make sure it's, it's caretake. So, um, but he may over the next three months want his builders, his surveyors to come in and check the water, check the gas, check the roof. So you say, look, if they ring us, this number that we give you, give us 24 hours notice, we'll allow them to come in and, and do what they need to do. And that's a really good one for, you know. Uh, the other little trick that you're trying to do is get you say we'll leave at a certain date that we agree with you without necessarily going to court and the costs. What you're trying to do in that interim period thing is to get them talking about <coughs> what date you can leave without going to court. And the trick is to get them talking about the date rather than the court case. And if he says, I want you to leave in a week, you've begun negotiations. If you say, well, when do you need to use it? And he says, well, in about four months. You say, well, why do you want to leave in a, a week when you say four months? What about two months? And he said, oh, no, oh, two months. How about a month? <coughs> and you're like, oh, well, I don't know about two. How about three months? He's like, oh, no, 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 a month. But once you're haggling over the date, one month, two weeks, three months, you're talking about an agreement. You're not talking about going to court in one week. So get them talking about a short period of time and offer to leave. If you offer to leave in two weeks, he thinks, oh, hold on a minute, it's going to cost me 500 quid to go to court. Why don't I leave him for two weeks and then I'll save my 500 quid and they'll go. And then you extend it on from two weeks to a month to three months, whatever it is. You can remind the landlord that there is a lot of people just breaking to stop stealing a great criminal damage. And yep. We have no option in that kind of people. Yep, we're looking after it, we're fixing it. Aaron? Reassurance, yep, yep, definitely. Okay, so the next one on from negotiating with owners. Anything else on negotiating with owners? You want to say anything? And maybe when, uh, when it's time to leave, ask him if he's got another property. <laughs> <laughs> you're bang on it, yeah, that's that you're, you're on it, you're reminding you me. So you say, is there any other properties? We're willing to leave, but is there any other property you'd so like to look after? Property. Exactly, young George. <laughs> Why do you think that the owner is offering us a uh, grand and a half to week tomorrow? Uh, he doesn't trust that. Because sometimes it could take longer. Yeah. It depends. Yeah. Bailiff costs money. Yeah. They have to go back twice. And it's, yeah. And yeah. And the lawyer, you need well. to show the and they paper. Have to and the documents with the land, like, show yeah. it. And they, they get half the documents as well yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Yep. Lots of complex. Yeah. 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 I think they could get even more money. I don't want to go into the uh, <laughs> chat on that, really. It's sort of a it does happen sometimes. Yeah. People offer yeah. money to leave. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's yeah. up to the group to discuss or whatever. Um, what are the other ones? Number eight is health and safety. So, <coughs> only become more aware of it in recent years when we got a deal on a big old building, Finchley Road. Uh, they gave us health and safety training, and we've had an ex council officer for about 15 years used to come to our squats and give us a bit of advice on fire exits, health and safety, and uh, kind of stuck with us over the years. But um, there's just a few basic ones that, you know, when you get into a building, obviously you want to clear it up, fix it up, clear up the rubble, clear up the mess, anything that's sharp or is going to hurt people or damage anything. Um, so, health and safety. To the health and safety training person, you can get in touch with people who do it for festivals or get an email checklist, look at them on the internet. Now, always check that your fire exits are openable and kept clear. This is everything. Every community centre and a party and event, always make sure that the fire exits are openable and the immediate, like, kind of six foot going into them is clear. Nobody's put any bags, any guitars, any chairs or whatever in the way. I think I sometimes you have to paint two white strips, kind of like six foot in front of the fire exit. It's really, really important you do that because you've got a big event with 300 people at a party or a thousand people, whatever, and 
suddenly there's a fire, 400 people trying to get out the door and it's all got bags on the floor. Always keep it clear, keep checking and make sure it's openable. Obviously when you initially get in, sometimes people barricade fire exits and that you do that for the first few days or whatever and first week because it's safe, but remove those and make sure it's openable whenever you've got events and stuff. Um, so fire extinguishers are kept on the rack next to the fire exit door. So you should basically always, wherever there's a fire exit, quite often there's a little rack, you know, where you put the fire extinguisher. Put them there, up on the hook where people can see them, and try and make sure you've got working ones around. Um, trip hazards are removed from all corridors. A trip hazard is just anything, a wire, a, something that people can trip and fall over. Just look around before you've got an event and move anything that people can trip. Yeah, next one, number eight, uh, health and safety. Health and safety, keep the health and safety. Um, so chip wire uh, hazards away from corridors. It's an old expression in the Navy, keep the gangways clear. Um, basically that's on, on warships and whatever. They always make sure the corridors and the gangways are clear because sometimes you have to run around when it all gets hectic and you don't want to trip over things. So that's the same thing, keep the gangways clear. Feng Shui and Hepa, yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> keep the Feng Shui happy. Uh, electric safety check. Check all plugs and areas for bare wires, particularly when you turn the electric on. Don't have a look around if there's any plugs or wires sticking out. You basically turn the electric back off and tape them up with some gaffer tape or electric wire or whatever it is. Very important if you're doing that. You open up the community centre. You want it to be safe for people. <coughs> Another simple one from uh, from the festivals and from running community centres. Wipe full surface in the kitchen. Uh, hygiene. A buy a stock of cleaning equipment and bin liners early. So basically, a lot of things at a uh, uh, festival, health and safety, all they're asking for is a wipeable surface. So even if you've got old tables at wood or whatever, just get some plastic type, cheap type thing, stick it over. As long as it's going to be wiped like a plastic top, it's health and safety and uh, try and keep the hygiene up in the community centre. Um, check the gas supply is safe, make sure it's on or off or whatever it is and you know, you can't smell any around. <coughs> the other good one to pass on is always remember the bin line again. So you get out the uh, flat bin liners, then anyone got a bin laden, then anyone got a bin liner, we need to uh, basically clear up. Do you get them out for an event, uh, you know, before everyone's gone home for the event, so it's not just the crew who have been running it for bloody weeks to have to tidy up, and you give them out to people, like two hours before the event ended, and basically you really know who helps you tidy up then and clear up, and the people who pick up them bin liners and help up and tidy up and chuck stuff in are really on it, you think, right, these are new crew, these are people I want to work with again, because you're on the case, I like you, you know, you can come back, you're always welcome at the community centre. So uh, <coughs> remember the black bin line again, and also um, the people who've helped clear up, you know, uh, very old caretaker who's passed away now, James Yellow Submarine, long way spirit live on, used to say, big up the backstage recycling crew. The backstage recycling crew are the people who are the, the core of keeping the community centre going, they're the people who hang around <coughs> backstage and uh, uh, around when events and things are going on and they're there to help run the place and to tidy up at the end and to fix things and to keep things going. So look after the backstage recycling crew, give them a few beers, give them a few spliffs, whatever it is, look after each other, bung them some money when you've got some money from the event, look after people, look after your crew, spread it around the crew, make everyone happy and feel appreciated. And even if you haven't got any money, spliff or beer, go up to people and say, thanks very much mate, cheers for tidying up, thanks for fixing that, you're a really good geezer, really good sister, thank you very much. And it's always appreciated, you know, appreciated the crew and everything. Um, so, number nine. Uh, <coughs> so, write up a set of caretakers' guidelines. So we used to call ourselves caretakers, people who run the project. What's expected to be welcoming, friendly, to explain to people how the project runs while you're doing it and where things are in the building, such as toilets, kitchen facilities, that kind of thing. <coughs> it's just a basic thing, really, when you're a caretaker, all you, you're Sometimes you'll have a rotor for it, sometimes it's less formal. You're just there to welcome people, basically, and tell them where things are. Hello, mate, what's your name? Yeah, my name's Phoenix. Uh, this is the community centre. You know, there's a cafe over there, you get a cup of tea. There's, you know, the creative space over there, bike repair workshop, garden in there. What's your name? What do you do? How do you want to help out? Do you like the place? What do you think? Do you live in locally? Just chatting to people. And just being there, being a, a responsible person at the time. That's what being a caretaker is. Um, <coughs> the other one on that kind of guidelines is a safer spaces policy, <coughs> which always needs to be created early and put up clearly. Now, it's come about a lot more in the last 10 years where we've had 
things from climate camp and other activist things where you develop safer spaces policy, things like Occupy is pretty good on them. It's a really good thing for the group to determine themselves based on, you look at other ones that have been done, there's ones on the internet, and I can tell you a very basic one now, but um, it's really important to get that up because things do happen in these community centres. You do get people come and be a bit aggro, people a bit threatening, people trying to be angry, sometimes fighting, whatever it is. And if you've got a set of guidelines put up, safer spaces policy, not just in one place near the entrance, but two, three, four places around the place, uh, I'm a firm believer in chucking up quite a few signs around the place. Sometimes we all bloody too many signs, but it does half the work for you. Because if people come in and see safer spaces policies, they think twice before they, if they've read it while they're in the cash in the toilet and on the way in, they'll actually think, oh yeah, hold on a minute, these people are on it. Um, so this is a very basic, very condensed safer spaces policy that I've come down to, and there's loads more you can add to it, and there's other better examples on the internet. But you can also, um, it's good if the group themselves, on their Monday meeting or whatever, <coughs> Tuesday meeting, whatever you decide, discusses it themselves. Because when they discuss it themselves, they, they own it, they believe they've created it, it's their guidelines, their rules, whatever you want to call it. We used to have to call it rule, uh, guidelines around the anarchic posse because everyone wants to rebel if you make some rules, so it's guidelines. <laughs> <laughs> but this safer spaces policy, very basic one. Uh, no violence, no threats of violence, no racist, no sexist, no homophobic behaviour. Okay? I'll say them again, and there's lots more you can add on to this, but this is a very, very basic one. No violence, no threats of violence, no racist, no sexist, no homophobic behaviour. Um, now, the key onto that as well is that you have to also have some sanctions of what's going to happen if people break that. And that's the thing that's missing from so many safer spaces bodies. It tells people, you know, we don't accept this kind of behaviour, but what happens if people do it? Um, so what happens if people do it, some kind of sanctions is, you know, you have to put, you know, and obviously this has to be discussed by a group and owned by a group, correct, but if people break the safest poli safest policy, safer spaces policy, um, for minor breakings of it, they will be given one or two warnings, um, but for major breaking of it, they will be made to leave for a short time or for a long time. Uh, in a tribe, we used to call it the short walk or the long walk. So make them leave for a short time, a long time, they could, you know, if, if they've done a major thing and they've been, whatever it is, racist, sex, or violent, you could say, we don't want you to come here for whatever, one, one week, two weeks, one month, two, two months, or that's a bit more the short walk. If they're being a complete pain in the arse and they're causing a lot of problems and they're not listening to the group and the group's asking them to leave, then you can tell them, well, you're going to have to take a long walk, mate, i.e. we're going to ban you and you're not to come back. Now, wouldn't it be better if you just leave now and we say we don't want you to come back for two weeks while you think about your behaviour? You've been threatening someone with violence, maybe there's whatever situations, whatever, or you've been this, that and the other. We want you to go. Um, deal with situations as a group. Sometimes it, it, it really varies. Sometimes it depends on the person or the, the group. Sometimes you're going to have trouble from one person or a group of four or five. Sometimes it's better for one or two, maybe three people to go and deal with it. Sometimes it's better for uh, men or women to go and, and deal with them and try and talk them down. Always try and talk people down and be reasonable and deal with stuff. And, but also deal with things as a group, particularly when you get threatening and violent people, then it's good when you go with a group of four, five, six, seven, eight, nine of you to deal with one or two or three people who've been threatening or whatever and support each other and try and talk them down and deal with these things. And the last one to put on that really is nobody in our, whatever you want to call it, squatting, travelling, alternative culture likes to call the police necessarily uh, or whatever, but when you've got angry violent man with the axe, with the machete, with the whatever, with the shotgun, we've been there, we've had a talking down, you, there is a time to call the police. No one likes to do it, but when you and your friends are in danger and somebody's got weapons or whatever, then do call the police. That's what they're there to deal with sometimes. Um, but, you know, stick your safer spaces policy up early, discuss it early and put it up early and, and you'll, you'll, you'll sort out half of your problems because people will see you are organising that front before. And this actually, is the, I believe, is the more uh, delicate point of all this thing because mm. you know, it's, it seems to be happening, especially when you put on heaven. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. this thing is happening when you put on heaven, and maybe there is even alcohol involved. Yeah. And uh, this 
met the, I, mean, I don't know about budget, but you know, sometimes they got professional security. Yeah, yeah. You know, there, which can help a lot because they need to start training. Yeah, yeah. They can talk. On bigger events, definitely, and people doing squat parties, I mean, that's all other factors on things, but you know, squat parties do happen at community centre stuff. <laughs> when you're dealing, you know, smaller events, then the crew gets bigger people who say, who are part of the crew or friends of the crew, will you be on the door and help with security? But when you go over a certain number of people, it's very good to <coughs> actually get some people in who are, you know, do security properly and are willing to deal with troublemakers or people who become violent. And you've got whatever it is, two, four, six, eight or more security people there who can deal with, with stuff, particularly when you've got a very big event or party. Um, but this more community centres, safer spaces policy, deal with it as a group and you know, if people realise they will be talked to if they if they break that safer spaces policy and have to, you know, get a warning or to leave for a short time or a long time. Uh. Um, having a tobacco and alcohol free zone you set the ground in the Yeah, we come into that in a bit. Uh, it's up to each group and it, every group has its different flavour and what they're into and uh, the group can discuss. Uh, I'll come on to that in a, in a shortly, actually. Um, so, next one. Num uh, number nine, caretakers. Next one. Big question that needs to be addressed. Oh, yeah, you got it, Aaron. We're right on that one now. Big question that needs to be addressed and dealt with early by the group is what is the attitude towards alcohol or not and drugs or not in the building? Clear focus is set from the beginning and it helps the project uh, foc uh, keep focus throughout. This is a very large debate. And obviously we haven't got time to go into all of this now, but it's each different group has different attitude, different flavour, whatever it is. But it should be a discussion that happens in your first meeting or two. Do we want to say uh, people are allowed to have alcohol here or drugs here or not to smoke, or whatever it is, in a certain area? You can help sometimes by saying there's a designated smoking area or a designated drinking area. I mean, where we've been running community centres over the year, we've had, we've had everything. We've had times where we've said no alcohol, and we say there's no drugs, but people do smoke in certain areas further back. We've had times where it's just been a free-for-all and people say, whatever. Um, it, it's good to, you know, if you're running a community centre, sometimes one of the compromises we've had is just said to people, no drinking before 7 o'clock, um, no kind of smoking in the main guests and, I was going to say public areas, but guests and friends areas, so you have a main area and then maybe people can smoke in the back rooms or out in the garden or out in the balcony or whatever. Um, you do need to look at this, you know, if you've got mums and kids and all ages coming in, if they walk in the door and there's a group of six, seven large men with cans of massive, you know, and large it up and really, you know, people get drunk very early in our scene sometimes and if they're sat around, go, rah, fuck it, yeah, rah, 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 it puts off the community, it puts off local people. So it's good for the group to discuss whatever they want. You can say, come in, you can drink as much as whatever you want. You can say, please, no, no drinking or alcohol in this space, or no drinking or alcohol before seven, or this is the area that you do drinking or alcohol. So that's just to pass on some of the learnings for years. And it's good to get people have, have an outlet valve and say to people, you can drink and smoke, but in these rooms or in this area. And then you kind of keep the that the drinking and smoking posse happy as well as the healthy parents, you know, drinking and smoking posse happy or whatever, you know. You've got to try and balance things in, in this. It's a great joy of dealing with all the different opinions in community centres and how people want to do well, things. Yeah. So outlets of people's energy, doing stuff. Um, so whatever the group has decided in its early meetings, it's good to put signs up all over. It helps get your marker pen, print stuff out, laminate it, whatever, stick it round. And then you can say either. Um, you know, people don't like it when you say no, but I thought him put a good one into me the other week. You say, rather than no alcohol, no smoke, you say, this is an alcohol-free space or a smoking-free space. Or you say, designate smoking areas out in the garden or this room or this balcony or, or whatever it is. Um, put those signs up and that will do half the job for you. Um, on a lot of protest camps, just a little bit of history, through the road protest camps towards the, the end days it got very messy with lots of people drinking and lots lots of issues and it put off a lot of local support. 
and the few people can knock that in things they were writing and stuff. Um, and it does affect, particularly when you're having a protest, trying to keep things clear. I noticed the recent, some of the recent protests in, in Kiev, I think, Ukraine, they said there was absolutely no drinking anywhere in the main square, which I was really surprised at, actually, but um, they managed to maintain that, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, well, well. Um, so, it's, like I said, it's a very big debate, but it's good to put those signs up and, and work things out. So the next one is uh, caretaker's log book and visitor's book. We're in the last little section now, last kind of third of it or something. So basically, we always had a kind of uh, a caretaker's book. We'd also have a visitor's book, so like a caretaker's log. So I deal with a visitor's book first. It's really amazing the amount of energy and contacts and people and skills that come into this building. When you're open for two months, two years, whatever it is, you will get musicians, artists, cooks, plumbers, musicians, everything. All sorts of incredible skills come in through that door. Photographers, bike repairers, every photocopier engineers, you know, whatever it is. They're all out there and they all want to help. So you have five, you know, A4 book from the pound shop, stick it right by the entrance, and you put three columns on it. Name, uh, uh, what is it, uh, contacts, uh, or skills and comments. So you put your name, John Smith, your, your contact, phone number or email, and then skills of comments, I'm a carpenter, wow, I think you're doing a really wicked thing, or I'm just in from Lithuania, nice one guys, cheers. Um, I've got them from down the years, over 20 years, it's incredible what people have written in them, and I've always wanted to kind of get them working more effectively. What you need to do really <coughs> is make sure that that book is typed up every two or three days, uh, rather than having it on bits of paper and then the bits of paper get lost, you have it in a book and then someone from whatever the, you know, the admin office team or whatever it is, working group, any trouble working group yet? Um, basically types that up every three days and then you build up an email list of 200, 300, 2000, whatever it is, put it onto your, you know, your other networking things. And then when you're going to have an event, you can have a cinema night, you can have a food night, you can email 200 people. And the other one is to really use that effectively. And <coughs> we've done it a bit, but it's what I've wanted to do more is actually have someone who's on the case looking through that book and ringing people up. Say, hey, Alfonso, you're a chef, yeah? Do you want to come in and help with our Thursday night food night? Or, hey, you, you know, Philippe, you've got a video projector, yeah? Do you want to come on the Friday and do the thing? People like to help, is my experience over the years. People want to be part of something, they want to get involved with things, you feel better when you're using your skills. If you're a, a carpenter or a photographer, you feel happy when you photo in an event and put it out for people. So ring those people, email those people, get them involved. We all need community. We've been fractionalised and divided and they've got us all off in the individual spaces a lot in society. And we need more community centres and we need to get involved. So create these community spaces, contact people, call them, bring them in, create one big happy family and tribe and keep doing it. Uh, <laughs> So that's the visitor's book. The other one is the caretaker's kind of log book or the project log. You basically in that you write down anything of note that happens during the day. Important workshops, visitors, official visits like council or police or uh, gas or water or electric, whatever it is, uh, media that comes in, repairs and maintenance that have been done or communication to other shifts. So couple of you are running it till whatever, six o'clock, and then somebody else is coming in six o'clock in the evening or come in every couple of days. They can then read in that, right, we fixed the toilets, right, we met the council guy came around yesterday, oh, the owners came and they said they're happy for to stay for another month, or, oh, we need a video projector because whatever. Um, so really, it's good to have that logbook and pass it on so that people can keep up with what's going on, uh, especially if people aren't there every single day. So, next one which helps continuity and pass things on. Uh, two other key ones are things, uh, the things to do in the wish list. Every community centre starts basically, as well as your meetings, with these two things. A missions list or a things to do list. So you write down things to do. Uh, barricade the back door, uh, fix the roof, fix this window, uh, somebody design a leaflet, somebody organise the workshops take the rubbish out, whatever, and you make that list up on the wall, quite big, so that anyone can come, get involved, see what needs doing, and, and hopefully do it, cross it off when it's done. Uh, the other one is a wish list, which is basically, I was always started off with three things, food, paint, tools, and then you add other things, bedding, bikes, old computers, paint, whatever it is people want to bring. And 
it's amazing at manifesting things. People bring you everything you need. It's, it's great. So what, right up your wish list. No one from the process. Okay, so. See what's helping me go on. Things to do, skills, wish list. So it should be used more effectively than the skills to help me get involved. Visit the book, should have name, content, I've just got that. Okay, so next one, last bit really is um, a cleaning rotor is also helpful. We didn't always have a cleaning rotor in most of us, of course, in our old age. It's also helpful to keep it clean and tidy and focused. Uh, transparent accounting, it's good to write down everything that comes in when you have an event or in a donations thing and have open transparent accounting so everyone can read it. We only made 30 quid this week or we made 300 in the party or whatever it is and it's spent on washing up scrubbers, bin liners, uh, 50 quid for, or 30 quid for petrol for this guy to get the washing machine or whatever it is. Um, look after the crew, put some money into food or whatever the crew needs. Um, Okay, so coordinators for working groups such as admin and events. Um, I think it was somewhere else, but something about working groups, last little bit really, is basically it's good to set up working groups for whatever it is, admin, legal, uh, workshops, events, repairs and maintenance, and have a coordinator for each of them, it's kind of revolving role, coordinators that can change over. It's good to have continuity, so someone doing it for a while, a month, two, three months, but not necessarily the same person doing it forever because then it will build up hierarchies and someone's running that department or whatever. So revolve the roles but have enough continuity. Uh, last little bits on court case and networking were finished basically apart from any questions and answers people want or whatever. Um, yeah, remember the working groups. It's really good to put working groups in because um, it really helps the project be more organised when you've got you know, you know you've got a repair and maintenance group and you can ask them what's going on with the fixing roof, what do you need help with, or a legal group, or a admin, or a cafe group, or a, a whatever it is. Try and form them early on. It will make the project run more, more effectively and efficiently. Many of the things you need, for example, like a uh, uh, washing machine, mm. you find the seat, master aspect, and that's, yeah. uh, you know, maybe it's, it's a bit of my intention, like change the fuse or clean the filter, but yep, yep. most of the time it's working. It's Something we like to get going from the Dutch crew, they did something called repair centres, where they get a few people who are good at soldering and fixing people, and people just bring in old hoovers and videos and they fix it up. So. Chests. That's what I'm always into. Okay, the last one uh, is court case. Uh, I won't go too much into it because, you know, again, it's the squatting workshop and always check your court stuff with advisory service to squatters, get it down as early as possible, they get annoyed with it if you leave it too late, have a meeting on Wednesdays, I think. Sort of, there's a few points you can get things adjourned on. Go to squatter.org.uk. Um, there's now only a two-day limit. I to give you two clear working days notes to court on non-residential buildings. That does include Saturday and Sunday. So that doesn't include Saturday and Sunday. So they've got to give you two clear work days not including that. Sometimes the map's not clear. They haven't drawn the map correctly. You can say that it contains another address of a, of a neighbour who's a tenant and they could, they'd evict them as well if, if they evicted you. Um, there may be a tendency that still exists somewhere on part of it. Uh, also, there's a license may be possible. If anyone from the owners of the company says you can pay for a day or a few days or a week, it can create a license, therefore you're not trespassers, therefore you're not squatters. You know, someone from the owners said we could pay for a week, but then we had to go. Well, they have licenses to be here for a week, therefore it's not under squatting law, mm -hmm. trespass law. What about uh, sometimes when you squat a place, uh, you know, you call the police, Sometimes, but the issue is that basically the police then try and find the owners, and most time they're fairly good at finding the owners, and that means the owners know you're quicker. Generally, what ASS says is don't contact the owners until they have first contact and find you, because sometimes you can get one, two, three weeks before the owners are now, particularly when they've only got a short amount of time notice for court. It's better to get as much time as you can before the owners know you're there. Um, so, that's the last bits really. Keep networking, keep networking, keep networking. Do it for the love, the people <coughs> and the planet. Keep networking. Think in circles, think collectively, think tribally. Um, keep taking action. It builds the project and network over many, many years. Like I say, we've been doing it in our kind of rainbow group for about 20 years, setting up all different sorts of community centres. 
Sometimes you do two or three in a row and then it's good to take a break for three months, six months or more or whatever. It can be very tiring, but it can be very rewarding, amazing. Uh, keep networking for many years towards a sustainable future. It can be the biggest adventure of your life. You can make new friends and help community. You have the wickedest laugh. You can create a lot of really good spaces that a lot of people can come in and enjoy themselves. And, you know, it, it creates community. You meet new people and, you know, like I say, you have a great adventure and great fun. So uh, I hope you all get a bit of inspiration from this and over the next years create many more community centres and we'll all come and visit and have fun. And uh, so that's most of the workshop. Any other questions or answers? I'd like to say, like, uh, theoretically, in my opinion, no? Why doing these social centers, because I know that the residential option, but it's an option to engage with the lifestyle that you are really looking for, where making it happen with the people you're living with, and engaging with the people that they come to your place, to your social yeah, center, to do the stuff. Theoretically, also, you should be able to go in a level when you reach this point. It's like now a little bit of utopia, but it's started to happen, and it has happened when you can engage with the community in a point that you can build a, f a trust, a cooperative, etc., and actually even acquire the building in this mm -hmm. stupid bullshit thing of having titles of property that I might not be uh, agreeing with that system, but it kind of saved me a pain in the ass if I could be with the community, with the people owning the building, also in their stupid society cycle of property. Yeah, so happened, by, yeah. by getting no. more expertise into running these social centers, we really no. can achieve this point where we liberate buildings. Like you liberate food in Tesco, now you liberate no. a fucking building. Right? That's what we used to call it. And this it. is where we come in. This is where we're going with yeah. the people all together. Re recycling or liberating empty buildings, we used to call it. You know, we'd liberate them and share them out with people. There is one and a half million empty buildings out there in the UK, 900,000 empty residential buildings, uh, 600,000 commercial non-residential buildings that we, you know, no one needs to be homeless. There's a false housing crisis being created. We need to recycle and liberate these spaces and create homes and community centres. Uh, last little bit to bung in. I suppose on the latest bits on the squatting law, the government the other year made it a crime to squat residential buildings. However, you can still squat non-residential buildings such as shops, warehouses, uh, pubs were made exempt from the law, so you can definitely still squat pubs. Tell that to the police if they're trying to say it's residential, say in Parliament, they exempted pubs from this law and there's a special section six for pubs. But you can squat post offices, you can squat libraries like the one we did up free in Barnet recently. Um, yes, all churches. hospitals, yes, churches, yes. all different spaces, that are normal, anything that hasn't got a bedroom or is adapted to have a bedroom, I think it's basic definition of law. The other bit I want to come on to is that people have had some success recently by challenging the residential bit of squatting law by occupying residential buildings and saying we're occupying this as a housing protest. We're not living here. Some of us have other squats and other addresses and we can give you those other addresses. So they say to the police, we've occupied this as a housing protest and they've had some success where the police on a couple of them have left and gone away and not arrested anyone. There was one recently uh, that you know, they did arrest, but basically we're hoping that a lot more people do actions on residential buildings and challenge the law and say we're not happy about this, this is a housing protest. The definition of the law is if you're living squatting and living in a residential building and what they say is we're not living here, we're occupying on a rotor basis for two or three days at a time as a housing protest. So keep resisting the law on squatting, keep occupying, keep recycling, keep liberating and uh, create more community spaces. Any more uh, feedback, uh, input, questions? Do an update on the Camden one, the one that I should, is that the reason one that you were talking about? Yeah, I showed up because eh, I didn't want to go too far on that because there is going to be some legal um, ah, okay. test <laughs> case and uh, as the legal people say, keep your powder dry. I'm not going to say too much at the moment. There's a, there's, there's a very good test case coming up. Okay. Um, we'll see. Uh, anything else? Any other questions? Uh, I have another one. We're going to have tomorrow 7 o'clock tango here. Right. So everyone welcome. And then Saturday we're having a massive cabaret. This building was built in the 80s and they had aerials and we're going to do the show now, Very nowadays. Good. So, uh, come up, support, and there's plenty of amazing art happening. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, it's 11 o'clock, we're all going downstairs and we're going to bang into a six in the morning to come. <laughs> okay, so, done. Uh, I don't know if there's any other.
Mount Spencer. Yeah, but the spiritual temple not just a square, as a core case against the pillar. So we're wanting to fill the place up with like creative, vibrant, positive energy. So a day of meditation, music, yoga, starting at 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're also going to do a, um, 